So Ian, thanks thanks for your time here. I know it's late in the evening and we've got a lot to get on with the families and stuff, but it'd be great to hear, hear about your career and where you've what you've done in it and how you've got to where you are today. Um, so as a starting point, just give a quick intro into yourself and why people should watch this video um, and then we can move on to some career industry questions. Hi Carol, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Ian Warren. I'm a Cloud Solutions Architect at Microsoft. Um, that role basically involves um, speaking to some of our largest customers. Um, so getting them to um, get on board with some of our public cloud services, specifically around Azure infrastructure services. So, uh, so yeah, that's my, my current role to date. Perfect. And so how did you start out? Right? Where did you start and how did it progress for you? Yeah, so um, I mean, finishing university, what I did is as part of that degree course, I did a sandwich course, a sandwich year, where I was um, a year at a housing organisation just doing an IT role, like a, a first line support type role. And so I was fixing printers, it was working with Novell Netware and <laughs> Windows uh, Windows 3.11, that sort of thing, and clown and the desks, and it was really good, really enjoyed it, to be honest with you. So. Um, you know, we we had a, a partner at that time who came in and did some various work for us, and we had an issue with our with our Novell server at the time with some backup software that wasn't working. I think it was Zark server or something like that. So um, there was a chap who came in, and he turned up, really nice car in the car park, came in and um, fixed the issue, and everyone just kind of thought, wow, you know, this is great. These guys come in and mentioned, you know, used all this noise to come and fix this issue. And I thought, you know what, I quite fancy, you know, doing that type of role. So that's really where it started. Went back to university, finished my degree, and I went and took a role at a, at a large professional services organization. And then it went on from there, really. Oh, perfect. And I think, I think everyone I spoke to has come through that journey of at least starting out at support at some point, right? And feeling the pain of an end user on the end of the phone um, being extremely upset that they can't reset the password because it's the same digit as they've had previously or the printer's not working or whatever it might be. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's one of the things I've learned so far across most of these sessions is that the foundation to being a, I wouldn't say a, a, a necessarily a good technical person, but a more rounded technical person is starting off at that level, understanding customer issues and constraints and then working your way through that, that kind yeah, of journey to, a, to an architect role or whatever it might be. Yeah. So what's a day in the life of Ian look like now at Microsoft? So what, what, what does your day in, like, consist of? Well, I mean, the day's changed, Kyle, as you know, recently because, uh, you know, we're not traveling. So <laughs> previous, previous to COVID, it was like getting up at, you know, silly o'clock in the morning, um, get on a train, probably down to London, uh, maybe for the day, maybe for a couple of days that week, cramming as much as I can in, maybe traveling down to Reading or to Paddington offices, and meeting other members of the team, that sort of thing, really. Um, you know, having workshops with customers, helping partners, all those sorts of things, really. And then, um, you know, getting back potentially late that night, you know, 10, half 10 or maybe later in the week. Um, but yeah, since, since COVID, I guess my role uh, has changed a little bit, you know, obviously confined to working from home now. Uh, I'm typically up. Uh, and speaking to customers, probably eight, half eight, obviously in some projects with some of our largest customers. Um, then again, series of workshops um, and typical time of day, really. But also at Microsoft, we embrace such a big culture of continuous learning that we have a lot of online um, video content that we have to go through, both for a technical type enablement, but also some of the soft skills and um, you know, some of the other uh, wider uh, skills that the organization wants us to have. So, yeah, very, very busy, and um, I'm sure you can appreciate, yeah. Yeah, and just like a, a bit of a random question, because like, obviously you were in, I remember working with you for a while at Kelway. What, what's, what's it like moving from the reseller world to the vendor space? Yeah, that's a fair question, actually. It's, I mean, I've worked for partners for most of my life, you know, since 99, um, all the way up until 2016 when I moved to Microsoft. And it's, yeah, it's, I guess it's, it's different. It's quite, I guess it's quite daunting to be honest with you because, you know, working for Microsoft, you're holding quite a, a big responsibility. You've got a brand to, um, to be, you know, responsible for when you're speaking to customers and to partners as well. And obviously, you know, I mean, 
guys like yourself, Kyle, you, you know your stuff, you know, you're well respected in the industry and within the organizations that you work for and within customers that you've done work for. And yet, you know, I find myself in, in situations where I'm now having to speak to partners who know their stuff and to try and help educate them further. So it's it's a big role, to be honest with you. And to begin with, it was it was, you know, it was it was tough to, to you know, to to get through that mentally. Um, but now, yeah, it's, you know, it's enjoyable and I don't work with partners so much anymore because I've moved into a customer facing role. But it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question, actually. And I'd say um, it's been a good move for me. Um, yeah. And uh, I've taken and drawn from the experience of working with people like yourself in, in the partner world. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, speaking to Jack earlier, he was saying that the biggest change for him moving from the partner world to the, the vendor space is the, it's the kind of, expectation people have of you yes. as a Microsoft employee. So okay. if you're coming in as an Azure specialist or an M365 specialist or whatever it might be, they expect you to know the answers. They expect you to know every single thing about the product portfolio, but what they don't necessarily realize is that product portfolio is thousands of thousands of different products and services that make that portfolio. And there's no way you can know it all. No. So sometimes, like, and, and I think Jack was saying, was saying earlier that sometimes it goes to his customer and they'll be telling him about something that's it's only just come out and he wasn't even aware of because he's not got to that bit yet because he's that busy doing other bits and bobs. So it's, yeah. it's, it's basically, yeah, you are Microsoft, but you're also, as you said before, that, that continuous learning and trying to keep on top of things is a, is yeah. a big challenge for everyone, I think. It's also difficult because we have, you know, different versions of release as well. So we have our generally available services, we have public preview, we have private preview, we have, you know, NDA content as well. And it's sometimes difficult to know, you know, what you can say to customers yeah. and partners um, and to not leave them with false expectations and so on. And so, yeah, you've got, you know, it's not just, you know, I guess like how it used to be, you know, when I was doing an exchange engineer type role or consultant type role, you used to get the product and then um, it'd be released and you'd learn how it's changed incrementally from the last version. And then that would be good for three, four years. Um, but as you know now, I mean, it's just not the case. I mean, it is, you know, you're, you're learning every day, to be honest with you, aren't you? As things change so, so rapidly. So, yeah. So um, what what made you want to get into the industry then? Was it just the love of tech or was it the, the guy in the flashy car turning up that made you think, I want to go and earn some money? What, 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 what was it? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think as a... Um, uh, as an early teenager, to be honest with you, you know, I, I got into IT, um, wasn't really, I didn't get an Amiga, I kind of, you know, I was the one who got the word, the word processor in the Amstrad, to be honest with you, so I, I spent most of my time kind of working out how to get things working, um, you know, looking at Windows 2, yeah. um, it was my first, you know, um, you know, uh, I guess my first, uh, experience of looking at uh, operating systems to be honest with you going back that far but it seemed like a, an exciting career you know it was new I guess and um, you know it was uncertain you know so that had its appeal it wasn't kind of a, a roadmap of you know maybe being a solicitor or an accountant it was you know there was loads of opportunity and I think if I took the right role then there'd be also an opportunity to travel as well which which is really appealing um, although you've got to be careful what you wish for sometimes there and um, so yeah it was um it was just the, the, the interest and the, the opportunity to do something different that perhaps you meant that you're going to be doing something different every day. And that had its appeal. Yeah. I think that's the thing that I love the most working in the channel, right, is every day is different. Every customer's requirement is different. Every single engagement has some kind of variance that means it's, it's like starting at the beginning every single time. I think being in internal IT for six years before I came into the channel and it was very much keeping lights on, mundane same thing over and over again a lot of the times and it was getting yeah. a bit boring right which is yeah. why yeah. i decided to jump into the channel in the end yeah so, so what would you say is the um the most memorable moment of your career today yeah so i mean i had to think about um about some of the things that i've been doing recently some of the things that i've been really you know proud of myself for doing and i think the standout thing other than you know being really chuffed to bits for getting a, a role at microsoft which was a standout moment in my career for me personally, I think presenting at Ignite, um, which I did probably about 18 months ago now, something like that, it was such a big milestone in my career to do that because it's something that I would never have seen myself doing 
you know, mm. five, 10 years ago. Someone had said to me, you know, go and present in front of 30 people 10 years ago. I'd be like, oh, you know, I don't know whether I could do that. But I've slowly built up and feel more comfortable doing it. And so when I got asked to present at uh, Ignite, the tour in London, um, I said, yeah, absolutely, I'll do it. And, you know, I said yes. And I thought, right now I need to work out how I'm going to do that. Um, and it was it was good actually. It was it was it was um, it was something I'll never forget. Turn up at the Excel Arena. First thing that I did was I walked straight to the conference room that I was going to present in. I thought, yeah, okay, that's that's not too bad. Okay, it's probably about five hundred people, which is a lot, yeah. a lot more than I expected. But it's okay, we can do that. Um, and then what happened was as the week went on, I was we were in the last slot. Um, me and one of the other guys. And the registrations kept coming and they kept coming and it was more than 500 and then it was 800 and we were keeping our eye on it. And then we got an email to say, well, we're really sorry. We need to put you in a bigger room. <laughs> we need to join this room with another room. And it was like, oh my God, what have I signed up for? Um, and so it was, you know, it was nerve wracking. It was, you know, it was nerve wracking um, because it was just short of a thousand people turned up for the Windows Virtual Desktop session that I ran. And uh, yeah, it was great to be honest. So that'll be the most memorable thing that I've done in my career. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I know. I know. A few years back, um, some of the one of the sellers in in Kelway decided to say, "Oh, it's okay. I've got a customer that's running a um, an internal business conference in Amsterdam. Do you mind going and talking to them about what we can do in GDPR and technology enablement?" I was like, "Well, yeah, there's a topic to go and talk about. Why not?" Um, so that, yeah, sure, I'll go and do it. I'll I'll, I'll pull something together. I got over there thinking it'd be an internal business, maybe 100 people at most, right? And then turned up um, the day before, walked down into, Am into Amsterdam uh, city centre and went into this really, really nice, massive, hidden complex. And the guy goes, oh, right, okay, I just need to mic you up. I was like, okay, cool. So he mic me up and everything else. He goes, right, and you'll, you'll hear the music. As soon as you hear the music, walk through those those curtains there and then you'll be be on stage and your slides will be up behind you and all that kind of stuff. Just make sure you use the stage, walk around and stuff. Don't just stand in one position. I was like, okay, this sounds a little bit bigger than I anticipated, but yeah, sure. Okay. And then walked out and it was like an auditorium theatre, right? There was three and a half thousand people awesome. from this organization globally on a, on a retreat thing on, on how to do more with IT and how to, how to manage people better and all that kind of stuff. It was such a mixed crowd of people. And I'm just walking out to this music and I look out and the lights dim down. And I could just see it. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> and it's like, the good thing was, is that um, the majority of people in the audience were not IT people and didn't have a clue what I was talking about in any way. Oh, right, okay. um, but that being said, it was still a really good experience for, for me. And then especially then afterwards having quite a number of those individuals coming and having a conversation at the side around what they need to, to look into. But I think next time I'm going to be asking the question, when you say small conference, how, how, how small, small. <laughs> That's it. But yeah, it's fun and games. So on that note, what would we say is the, the biggest mistake that you made and the lesson you learned from it? So, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Uh, for me, the biggest mistake in my career would be um, kind of changing gears a little bit almost slowing down so um you know i was in the part of the world for must have been you know 10 years something like that and then i was finding myself especially in the early part of my career traveling a lot a bit more than what i wanted to do you know i'll be um you know working away going away on a monday morning first thing coming back friday evening and um it'd be newcastle it'd be london it'd be, it'd be glasgow um and then, you know, we wanted to have a family and um, my son was, um, was, was due to be born, um, uh, you know, about 13 years ago. So I decided, I thought, well, I can't really sustain this type of career. You know, it doesn't make sense. You know, working in IT at this level just, you know, isn't going to work. So I decided to take a, a, a move away from working for partners and took an in-house role, as you mentioned earlier, doing that same type of thing every day. And it just didn't work for me. I just didn't enjoy it. Uh, so that for me was a bit of a, a bit of a mistake. I think I should have just thought things through a little bit more and taken a different type of role within the partner organization rather than just completely leaving the channel, I suppose. So yeah, that was a, that was a mistake, but you know, I lasted there 
well, a few months now, went to back went to go back into a partner type role, but a more of a pre-sales role, which was you know more accommodating to family life, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, rather than consultancy where you could be here, there, and everywhere, and yeah. get customers back and call more than maybe a pre-sales role, which you can do a lot of it over the phone if you really needed to. It's just yeah. nice to see people physically. Yeah, totally. Okay, and if we start thinking about any of the sacrifices you made on the way, because we kind of start to touch on it, right, with the sacrifices of living away and and maybe losing out on that social aspect and seeing family and things. Do, do you think you made any sacrifices on the journey? Yeah, I mean, it would be inevitably the the time away, the long the long days, you know, <laughs> you know, um, leaving leaving a house when everybody else is, is still asleep, and then coming back home when everybody else is asleep. Um, as you know, I'm sure you've you found yourself, and as many of us have done that before, you know, it's a huge sacrifice, isn't it? And you know, I think if you want to make a success of your career, you have to go through that. You know, in the early start, in the early parts of your career, you have to go through that, especially because I'm I'm based in Manchester, so inevitably a lot of the work that I'm doing is in London. So there's a lot of travel and expectations for me to be in that part of the country. So yeah, I think just the time away, the stress of it as well. You know, it you'll know, um, you know, it's a stressful role at times, and so you know, sleepless sleepless nights sometimes waking up at three o'clock in the morning thinking oh my god i just realized something you know i shouldn't have done this or i should have done that um so yeah i think uh the, the toll on your personal life um yeah quite intense at some, some you know, yeah that, that is a common theme that we've heard on a few of these sessions as well is that that, that taxing on social and family time ultimately yeah, and i think i think people you think you do have to go through it and there is always light at the end of that tunnel, right? We think about what we do now, and even to, to me and extent, I still do quite a lot of working away, but I try and limit it to maybe two nights a week, right? Which is a lot, lot better than most things. And if I think about the role as like a, say nine till five, not whether there is a nine till five anymore, but doing an internal IT role nine till five, realistically, that's a maybe a seven till seven role, really with travel and the other bits and bobs potentially. So by the time if you've got small children, yeah. you're still missing them either side of the day. Um, yeah, exactly. and you might not be getting on that journey you want to get to so I think there's an element of sacrifice but just be willing to to give up that time if you if you want to show your worth and progress as fast as you can definitely mm. that being said I'm not saying go away and do that because it's it's not for everyone that's for sure yeah. um, okay so if you think about looking back to you when you first started out right and or yourself and you decided to pivot into a, a vendor role or going back into internal IT and then back into the channel what would be the three tips you'd have gave give yourself now with hindsight um I think always I kind of embrace and expect a culture of continuous learning within IT yeah um I think it's different to many other types of work that you can do um or careers that you can have you know I, th I think like you say you know you go into a different uh, a typical role or looking as an accountant solicitor or teacher or whatever you choose to do I, you know for me I, I don't relate to the amount of continuous learning that you ha would have to do um in, you know in comparison to those roles you know every day every day is literally a learning day you know and you've got to stay sharp and you've got to stay on top of your game you've got to be prepared to um to accept that accept that as part of your role um i think the other thing to do is just have self-belief in yourself have confidence in your ability um so when you are talking to a customer you know challenge them you know um, don't just you know uh, go along with with their train of thought so be comfortable with your capability with your knowledge and challenge um you know what you're being uh, told is really important Another important tip for me, which I have found really useful, is understand what the industry ten trends are within IT, and you know try and try and hook onto one of them, try and grab one of them. So for me, that's what I've basically built all of my career from. You know, I remember in my early parts of my career, you know, it was always you know it was Novell because Novell was the thing back you know back in my early stages of my career. Then it was looking at, you know, um, NT and migrations from NT. Then VMware became big. So I jumped on VMware and spent a long time on my career on VMware. Um, 
it was you know you know NetApp, um, and now it's you know it's moved on into public cloud and so on. So trying to grab a trend or a series of trends and try and focus on them, those would be a big tip, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and has there been any point in your career where you've been at that 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 edge, that breaking point of quitting, and then thought, no, actually, I'm going to do something different and, and overcome that that mental barrier, shall we say? Is is that ever happened to yourself? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I think when I stepped down. Again, I think that was really the, the kind of, you know, um, the point where I thought, you know what, I don't know what to do now. You know, I, I've stepped away from working for partners and it was just uncomfortable for me. And so I just thought, well, what do I do now? You know, do I do I carry on doing what I'm doing or or do I go back into partner or, you know, go into vendor or, you know, that was a real period of reflection for me, I think. So, um Apart from that, you know, I wouldn't say I've come close to quit, but that would be the nearest thing, really, is just that confusion that I had at that point in time in my life. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the other guys even that were mentioning the same situation where they they jumped ship very, very quickly on the back of something that wasn't really an issue. Uh, and looking back, they were kind of sort of thinking, if they'd have carried on that course, they probably would have done very well for themselves. Yeah. Um, the challenge was is that emotionally at that young age, um, they decided that it wasn't for them. And jump ship fairly really quickly without really thinking it through okay awesome and let's go, let's go to some industry questions right so um obviously a lot's changed from windows 3.1 and novel directory services and all those kind of things right but what would you say is the biggest change that's occurred in the industry over the years that's public cloud you know without without question for me is the biggest change that and you know if we go back to server virtualization i think was was, was a change and a shifting you know in gear but uh I think public cloud has transformed so much, it really has. You know, if I look at the early parts of my career and the amount of time that I spent in server rooms, stood up in front of a keyboard building, or even building racks and wiring racks and, you know, plugging switches in and, um, you know, patching servers and, you know, all that sort of stuff, building SQL clusters. You know, when you look at the amount of time just to get a base platform up and running before you can actually do anything with it. Now it's just, just, just completely different, isn't it? You know, point and click, and you've got it. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's unbelievably been simplified and I'm kind of envious. And I think to myself, you know what? I wish um, public cloud was available back then when I was doing all of that kind of stuff because it would be a lot easier to be honest with you. So um, yeah, I think that's the biggest real shift. For me, and uh, yeah, it's really exciting time, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, I think so. with the, the pace of innovation coming from the likes of Microsoft and AWS and yeah. GCP and Google from from, a, from a, an extent, right? It's just at some point there's got to be this kind of this this plateau, right? There's got to be at some point, and maybe it's just wishful thinking, right? There's going to be a plateau of things just becoming stable and and just calming down for a period of time. Yeah. And then ramping back up again because we can't <laughs> keep on this innovation cycle, right? Because people are just going to become overwhelmed and if things change too fast, too much, they just they lose faith, right? There's too much risk involved as well. Yeah. Awesome. And obviously the pandemic and what's going on at the moment has had um, positive and negative impacts on people, organizations and, and everything. What would you say is the biggest positive and negative things that you've seen um, during this, this time frame? So I think for me, the positives is many organizations have now become a bit more relaxed to the idea and the concept of people working from home, which has then led to a, a, a better work-life balance for many of us. So, you know, I think, I think that's been a real positive um, in my view. I think some of the negatives and the strains really have been, you know, around around resourcing everything hasn't it you know i know publicly we've stated and, and made available the fact that um you know we've at the early stages of the pandemic perhaps you know struggled to meet consumer demand for, for certain services you know and that's that's has to be expected and i think you know that's obviously um frustrated many customers and so on so we've um you know we've seen some of the negatives there um you know people expecting services to be available you know all the time straight away um you know extreme high availability and so on and so you know that's that's been that's been tough setting expectations and addressing those um i think the positive on that for me was 
when the pandemic kicked off, right? I mean, everyone was bursting to the cloud because supply chain had just dropped through the floor and they couldn't get physical equipment, right? Yeah, um, was the once it got to a certain point, both Microsoft, I think AWS did the same as an end, a closer to the end point of it, but basically came out and said that all resources now are on a review cycle and either you're a blue light service or a national security service, so otherwise you're getting priority because you're important. And no offense to the enterprise businesses that need to function and run and earn money, but you're not keeping people alive. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to wait. And I think that was a, a good call from a lot of people, in my opinion, because there's been a lot of customers that I've worked with that were extremely thankful for that, because without it, they'd have, they'd have struggled to keep lights on. Yeah, yeah, we learned a lot from that. So yeah, that, that's, that's been another positive. That's a good, uh, good shout back, Kyle, actually, yeah. Um, well, like I say about the equipment and everything, you know, again, a negative really is, you know, trying to get hold of webcams, you know. <laughs> I, I bought a webcam about two years ago and it was 60 quid, something like that. Mm -hmm. You buy the same model now and it's like 140 quid. You yeah. know, so, you know, it's, you know, what is it because we just can't get hold of them or is it a case of organizations and shops maximizing out the profits that, that can be made so that people can work more effectively, you know. So yeah, it's been, um, it's definitely had, you know, positive and negative experiences. Uh, so yeah. I think as a top tip for anyone though that is watching, right, and you haven't got a webcam, right? If you've got a Canon camera, right? So forget the microphone thing. If you've got a Canon camera, as of, I think it was April, 2020, you can download the um, EOS Canon uh, webcam utility. So you can install that on a Windows or a Mac device and it'll actually allow you to use your DSLR or your ca mirrorless camera as a webcam. Oh, so really? that way it'll then plug in and you'll see it as just a normal input device or within um, Windows to basically then put it into Teams and Zoom and various other products to, to use That's it. Cool. I, actually, like, this is a 4K Brio webcam, right? Streaming webcam for gaming. And it's a fantastic webcam. This is only a 1080 camera at best, if I wanted to. I could do 4K, but it's not great. It's still a better web. It's still a better webcam than the actual webcam. Is it? Yeah, by, by far. But is the it? challenge is, is that um, I use that for more than just being sat on top of my monitor and staring at it all day. Oh, <laughs> so I can't really uh, justify it being sat there. But for anyone that hasn't got a webcam, 100% use one of them. You've got, is it a mirrorless camera, you say? Yeah, it's the Canon M50. Oh, okay, cool. I've got a, I've got a, a 50. I've, 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 forgot, I've got a 50D. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've got, no, I've got a 70. I've got the 70. I've played a 50D. Yeah, it's been a really good camera, to be honest with you. But I've uh, just not used it for a while. But yeah. 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 The, the beauty of it is, right, is you actually get to control your lens, right? So with these things, they're fixed lenses, fixed focal points, that kind of yeah. stuff. Change all that. You can change your focus levels and all that kind of things very easily on one of those cameras compared to one of these. So uh, yeah, top tip for me is if, you, if you're struggling to find a webcam and you've got a camera and it's a Canon today, go and download the software and you've got a webcam for nothing. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 So on, on that kind of note, right? So if you think about um, the technology that's in use um, within organizations today, is there any that you feel are undervalued or not invested? Yeah, so the areas that I think are undervalued um, that organisations are typically invest in would be, I'd say, getting uh, getting their employees working from home, um, you know, comfortably. So you know, making sure that they have things like I mentioned there around the webcams and all the microphones and everything. Make sure that they have the correct, you know, seating and desk. You know, at Microsoft, I know that we. We provide customer um, employees with with that sort of thing. You know, we make sure that we have the right um, you know seats and equipment and everything, and making sure that um, you know we have you know the, the right technology to be able to work effectively because we are obviously doing a customer facing role. So I think I think that's important as a as a real type of you know um, uh, you know area of technology that needs to be invested. In, I suppose so. Really, just all up being able to work effectively from home. Yeah, I think it's great to hear that, that Microsoft have extended their duty of care, right? So yeah. to, to help employees to work from home safely. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people, right, that I see that are hunched over a kitchen table, that are sat on the beds all day, or lay on a bed of a laptop on the chest and all that kind of stuff. And for the last seven, eight months of doing that, right, I'd hate to think of the impact that's had on their, their physical bodies and their backs and even their posture and things, right? Um, so it's good to hear that at least Microsoft has started going down that route. I know that CDW have been helping our employees out with certain things and sending care packages for mental well-being and all those kind of things. Yeah. I think there's a lot of organizations out there that just haven't thought about that and just gone, well, everyone's working from home. 
I'm just just left it there. <laughs> I know. It's, yeah, I mean, you have to take some responsibility yourself, don't you? As well, you know. I mean, I think I've gone recently some weeks where I actually haven't left the house. Um, and yeah, you can provide me with all the tech, with great technology and everything. But I think you know you need to try and get out and uh, you know whether it's go for a walk or even wash the car at lunchtime or something like that. You know, getting out uh, is really really important. So like you say, because otherwise you find yourself um, you know picking up you know ridiculous strains and so on just from being sat in the same place for yeah. far too long. So yeah. Yeah, I think managing my team, um, I've set that our, our Friday, Friday team call, which is about an hour, that everyone has their coat on and is ready to go for a walk. And we'll do the team call whilst we're walking for an hour. Oh, Just then it forces everyone to go and do something, right? If, if, and one of the guys may push back and say, well, it's raining outside. Don't care. Put a, put, take an umbrella, put a hat on, put a coat on, right? Go outside, get some fresh air, get wet. Yeah. And come back, dry off, sit down and then carry on with your work. Because that... I think the challenge I've seen a lot of people that have never worked from home before that now feel that they have an expectation not to turn off and they just sit in front of it for 12, 14 hours a day, hammering away on the keyboard and they've done maybe 500 steps for the entire day. And traditionally you'd have your commute as well. You'd have your lunch break, you'd have your water cooler conversations and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Picking up those steps, right? Getting 10,000 steps in easily in a day to go into 500 steps. Not that you should be counting steps, but still worth doing <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally relate to what you're saying there you know i think you know obviously when you're traveling if you're going down to to london and so on i mean it's just uh you know rushing around you know going from station to, to customer sites and so on you you do burn calories and it keeps you at least a little bit fitter than, than working from home so there are i guess some negatives there so yeah you've got to you've got to push yourself i think this week found myself very easily you know starting you know quarter to eight and then working well you know gone gone past you know half past seven eight o'clock because it's easily done you get you get yourself into a piece of work and it's difficult to take yourself take yourself away from it sometimes yeah um, yeah. yeah definitely and is there any any technology areas that are piquing your interest at the moment anything that's like an outstander that's thinking well, that's, that's something that's worth to spend some time on yeah sure i mean you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think I based a lot of my career actually following trends. Um, so looking at, you know, um, what's becoming quite large in the industry. So whether that was, you know, uh, you know VMware, you know, many years ago, or whether that was, um, you know, working with, um, uh, with, with NetApp or uh, with other solutions. Now it tends to be, a lot of my focus of my time is spent on Windows Virtual Desktop, um, which has obviously had a significant surge in interest because of the pandemic. But even outside of that, you know, we have seen a significant amount of interest, I think, from the likes of maybe the universities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're just working with a university that's just completed a migration of 17,000 users within, within a two-week period. Because they now have really, well, universities have changed since I went to university. They offer their, um, their learning um, and content out to international students. So being able to give that out um, via, you know, platforms such as WVD has been hugely beneficial. And yeah, you know, it's a technology that I'm really enjoying. It fits on public cloud as well. So it's not just very much focusing on end user computing. There is the whole story about leveraging our, our global infrastructure as well. So it's, that's, that, that's an area that I'm really interested in at the moment is driving, you know, a huge amount of, um, of interest across a lot, of, across a lot of our customers, yeah. Yeah, perfect, okay. Do you think there's any unsung heroes of technology, right? So my unsung hero of technology, I mentioned in every single session is an example is like Microsoft Flow, right? Yeah. Everyone's got it as part of the license. Nobody really uses it outside of maybe a couple of guys in IT, but there's so much that you could do with it if you just decided to be imaginative, right? Is there any unsung heroes you can think of that you, you want to kind of call out? Um, I think, you know, leveraging, um, you know, automation technologies, you know, being able to get away from doing mundane tasks all the time is really, really, um, you know, useful. I think, you know, a lot of organizations embrace it. Uh, infrastructure is code, you know, people should be uh, adopting that and using that as a way forward rather than just going for the usual click through the portal just mm -hmm. to, you know, to, to scale properly and to be able to deliver repeatable solutions. So, yeah, I think, you know, that side of things are really, 
um, often underutilized and some of the smaller customers that we work with. And from, first, from a personal point of view, I must say, you know, I love using the Microsoft Whiteboard technology as well when I'm having meetings as well. So using that to help articulate, you know, a, a diagram or a, um, a message I'm trying to get across that sort of thing. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier as well, Kyle, that you're uh, looking at getting a 48, 49 inch monitor or something like that. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I've got a, a large monitor on my desk. It's not as big as that mine, but we, <laughs> we um, I managed to track down something called Power Toys, actually, which is really cool. Uh, so that allows you to be able to segment. It's got a, a capability of being able to segment your screen so you can snap applications into like a virtual grid and stuff like that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, stuff like that I really like, something that really kind of, you know, helps uh, helps make your day a little bit easier because otherwise you have a large screen and ultimately all you end up doing is just maximising outlook, in it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the, my, my, my screen's right there, right? So once we finish this session, I've got the next few hours of dismantling the desk that took me four hours to put together the other week to yeah. get all of the wiring pulled out of zip ties to try and put it back together again. That's good fun, though, isn't it? It'll be a bit of fun. Yeah. Um, Okay, cool. So let's go into like a quick fire round, right? So quick snappy answers. Um, last technology purchase. Oh, I actually treated myself to um, a, uh, I, you know what? I actually treated myself to, I used to be a DJ years ago, actually. Another uh, one. Uh, Everyone's been a DJ on this, on this episode, <laughs> on this program. This series at of shows. university many, many years ago. And because of lockdown, I've been, you know, bored, stir crazy. So I actually got myself a new uh, Pioneer DJ, DDJ2, um, 1000. And uh, set of decks. So I've been playing around with that and, uh, you know, attaching and listening to some of my, uh, my 90s music. So I've been, <laughs> been loving that. Awesome. Yeah. I think everyone that I've spoke to has some kind of relation to being a DJ at some point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just a bedroom. Um, who's your biggest inspiration? Do you know, my biggest inspiration will probably be somebody like Bill Gates, I think, just because, you know, I'll never forget when I was younger, you know, I love working with with you know some of the early versions of windows and then i'll never forget the excitement and the build up to windows 95 and the marketing and the you know bill gates dancing on stage with steve balmer and then you know watching him build this organization that has just become incredible in terms of you know the the services and the scale that it, that's built out to be uh, but also now is is obviously um, doing a lot of work for charity as well, and you've got to really respect that he is giving away billions, billions, and billions of pounds and dollars, um, you know, every year to uh, deserving causes, and so that deserves a great deal of you know, respect. Yeah, definitely, definitely. What would you say work-life balance means to you? Um, so, I think having the flexibility really to make sure that you can have an hour away to watch the kids play the school football match, if you can, um, but also making sure that you are able to drive, you know, a massive amount of impact at work. So yeah, just being able to, you know, make sure that you are able to, um, you know, deliver your expectations at work, but have a, you know, um, the capability of being able to, you know, nip out and make sure your kids are okay or pick them up from school or whatever it might be really. So yeah, that for me is work-life balance. Yeah, totally. Cool. Uh, what did you want to do when you finished school? Uh, probably be a football, you know, kind of typical type of boy's answer, really. Um, you know, I used to enjoy playing in nets, I used to be a goalkeeper and stuff. So, yeah, I used to love to be the idea of being a professional goalkeeper, but, you know, it's never really going to happen. Quite pan really. out. <laughs> hey? Didn't quite pan out. Didn't quite pan out. really, no. <laughs> no. Uh, what is your favourite book? Do you know... I was hoping you wouldn't ask that because I don't actually read a lot of <laughs> type of you know non-technical type of books. You know, I must have read about five books in my life, um, none of which would be you know particularly interesting for the to, for, for me to disclose. So I think I would dodge that and just say, as I always do, I just read way too much um, technical type stuff that I you know I, I very rarely think. You know what? I fancy reading something more tonight. I think you know what. Uh, I do enough reading as it is, you know, on a yeah, daily basis. It's a, yeah. a fair comment. It's a yeah. fair comment. Uh, what's the most important thing to you? Staying healthy for, for me and my family is absolutely the, the, the most important thing to me. Yeah, totally. Uh, what would be your words of wisdom if it was in a tweet? Do you know, I'd probably say something like, be careful who you upset. Because <laughs> it's a small world <laughs> and it has a nasty habit of, uh, you know, 
uh, reuniting with you with many people that you may be, you know, uh, yeah. up to in the past. So, yeah. Yeah, don't burn your bridges because the yes. IT industry is incestuous. Particularly the IT industry. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, okay, favourite song? Um, I don't know, probably an Oasis song, something like Don't Look Back in Anger, something like that. Yeah, true Mancunian. Okay, uh, the new normal is? Working from home. <laughs> uh, must watch TV show? Um, I like things like League of Their Own. Yeah. Uh, match of the day, that sort of thing, really. Even I watch Coronation Street religiously now, it seems. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Favourite junk food? I don't know. Probably, I do like uh, Nando's. Yeah, good old Nando's. Yeah. Well, on that, on that Nando's, no, maybe probably call it a wrap on that. So, um, thank you very much for your time. It's been great talking about your career and uh, getting an insight into Ian's world. So, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Carl. Good to speak to you. Thank you.